there's, there's so much to say now, of course, after all these wonderful papers, and, um, and of course, each one builds uh, on the, uh, each comment has built on the comment before. Um, so I will probably be both uh, asking and answering questions, making comments, and going around in circles, but I hope that you, you know, that, that, that whatever I have to say will be of useful, uh, uh, of use to us for, for further conversation. Um, it was interesting because I, I felt that um, uh, Christie's response to, to Professor Young, uh, Professor Merrill, rather, her response was um, initially as student to professor, and of course now, of course, she is a, a very wonderful, brilliant professor herself. And I guess in, in terms of Bella and myself, it's more like colleagues and friends who are uh, participating in an ongoing conversation. And um, uh, in a sense, uh, uh, Bella does quote me uh, um, secretly, we translate to be translated, right? And uh, which of course is a, a remark I make uh, in my own book about self-writing, in my own self-writing about translation, which, uh, which was a very specific a book about my work with certain Latin American writers, the subversive scribe. Um, and uh, she quotes uh, this, but to move on to a much broader stage, obviously, um, a stage from, from uh, well, white Russian Nabokov to the Francophone Caribbean, from the science art of psychoanalysis to the pop genre of graphic memoir, uh, from canonical white males to uh, women writers who speak for the subaltern. There's a very broad range here. Uh, and in a way, she does this to uh, further our discussion of cultural translation and uh, giving us examples of uh, what, in a sense, Professor Young uh, theoretically set the uh, stage for this morning to a certain extent. Um, and uh, she also is, in a, in a way, I think what I feel her paper is doing is that she's trying to expand the definition of autobiography. Uh, which he seeks to do so by means of the code of translation. Uh, and this, of course, brings me again to this thought that I brought up this morning of how translation has become so used for so many things. You know, when I uh, was first uh, a translator academic, like my friend Larry Venuti, we were, we were uh, involved in a campaign um, to, to really make the translator visible, to make this a field. And I see that it really has really successfully become a field. I mean, I really do feel that in some ways it has replaced cultural studies, certainly in the humanist, era, uh, in the humanist context. Um, uh, I remember talking with uh, Emily Apter at, at, um, at UCLA a number of years ago about how, and I don't think she even was quite aware of how she was actually using translation as metaphor. And, um, you know, because it seems like, you're, you feel like you're talking about the process, but are you actually talking about the process of translation or just using this term, this concept, as a metaphor? And I think we've seen this morning how we clearly use it as a metaphor for culture, which of course in turn is a suppression or repression of a concept we don't use so much, which is civilization. And now, uh, this afternoon, um, with Bella's talk, uh, I'd like to propose a thought uh, which has to do with the concept of maybe we're using translation as a metaphor for narrative, okay? And um, uh, and uh, looking at, of course, uh, but I would like to, uh, you know, begin by going through uh, some of what she's spoken about. Uh, her first um, case study, uh, which is uh, Nabokov, is certainly um, would, would seem to be, uh, for uh, first hand, the closest to her topic from so many points of view. And, and, and I, I think maybe, I'm, and this is a question, was Nabokov who really inspired the thoughts, the beginning of this, was, was he the germ of this idea, or you know, was the combination of him and Freud the germ of the idea of your paper? Um, um, but certainly, uh, he is the closest as the uh, Russian emigre polyglot who was both an ironic, self-reflective self-writer as well as a self-translator. Indeed, he used translation as polemical tool, I think, uh, as a literary critic almost. Uh, and I think in that sense, uh, we, we might want to correct what Larry uh, Venuti said 
uh, that he was writing against the American Consumer Society, that is, or translating against it, because really uh, the first impulse that I think uh, angered Nabokov against the translations of the Russian, uh, the great Russian writers, was not an American, but a Brit, and her name was Constance Garnett, and she was, to her detriment, also a woman. So uh, Nabokov had a few issues with that translator, and uh, then, of course, he, you know, he talked about these wretched women who translate, etc. So, I mean, he's a funny guy. We know that. Anyway, I say that's the context of his original, uh, let's say, um, uh, polemic uh, not so much American consumerism, although, which is, of course, what we would see, from, you know, from an academic, American academic point of view today. It's important to make these comments always in a historical context. Anyway, mediating autobiography and translation is Bella's concern with also understanding the screening process of memory, uh, how memory both deforms and creates both the truths it seeks and the narratives that it proposes to represent, uh, i.e. represent the truth. Nabokov's insight, uh, shared with Sigmund Freud, uh, a man he shared nothing with, apparently, but everything with uh, <laughs> implicitly, is that all memory is mediated and motivated and dependent on a dynamic imagination. Because the raw material of original memory is not available, whether because of absence or inaccessibility, it cannot be restored without being translated to later experiences, desires, and needs. In this regard, Bella considers how autobiography, like translation, is a rewriting, a re-presentation. Now, at first glance, we could find this argument to be a stretch, much like the great diversity of texts that Bella brings together in her analysis. After all, unlike autobiography, a translation is normally a rewriting of a whole and visible text. It is not, at least on the surface, the reconstruction or restaging and coherent form of the fragments of memories of a life lived. If we look closer, however, a translation performs a comparable artificial resuscitation. The original language has vanished in the text's new version. The language that replaces it works to resurrect words and phrases, word plays and metaphors, fragments of the translator's language and mnemonic associations that will bring to life the original one hopes as one expects the same as you speak of that pact from an autobiography. Bella's discussion indeed departs from the basis of this readly expectation, uh, uh, which is like the translator's sacred duty to be true to an original. And yet the end product of both practices becomes a kind of Faustian Frankenstein under the aegis of Freud. As Manuel Puig, the uh, subject of my, he's the Argentine writer who was the subject of my biography, um, most famous for Kiss of the Spider Woman, as he emphasized uh, in his own thoughts about being a novelist, and he was, by the way, considered Latin America's first pop novelist, he said Freud basically uh, undid the omniscient narrator. Uh, after that, it was, that person was impossible. Freud invented the modern novel, in short. Uh, and of course, those be betrayals of that narrator uh, can certainly be compared to those of the translator, who can only give us approximations, uh, never the thing itself. <clears throat> so again, the main question I'd like to bring up alongside of uh, Bella's uh, negotiations of the subject she analyzes, are we talking about autobiography and translation, or are we talking about narrative? Uh, uh, that is, uh, in, in general, narrative as what we use to, to, to try to express, to tell the truth. Are we proposing a narrative theory that can be applied to any form of narrative beyond verbal uh, language and written texts? Now, um, as and here I'm going to go back to my old friend Borges. As, as, uh, as Borges' very first fiction, and that was indeed his very first fiction, fiction, uh, as he says, has, uh, Pierre Maynard, author of Don Quixote, uh, uh, his famous parable that was written in 1939, which speaks about the act of reading and about translation as creation, as he shows us very spectacularly in that piece, no two narratives are the same. 
uh, in a way, Borges is Nabokov's Argentine counterpart, and he has the same opinions of Freud, even though he is also a perfect, uh, a perfect uh, patient for that couch. Um, well, along with translators like myself, you know, we're all analysts and analysands and suicides and fetishists. We're, we're all those things. Anyway, so these two guys share all that in common. Uh, and um, <clears throat> anyway, so where was I? Uh, so Borges, uh, uh, like Nabokov, uh, explores really translation as transcreation. Transcreation, of course, the term coined by Pound when he spoke of his own subversive poetry experiments with the languages and forms of other cultures. Or, and Pound, uh, by the way, we were asking this morning, what is a language? And Pound said, well, a, la a language is a uh, successful conquest. <laughs> That's what a language is. Um, uh, translation in this context is a fiction of fidelity, as autobiography or other so-called factual narratives are. Indeed, Pierre Maynard is presented to us as a bio-bibliographical essay that is both pseudo-biography and a disguised autobiographical meditation on Borges, the young avant-garde poet who set out to destroy and recreate the Spanish language. Just as Pierre Maynard's word-for-word -word identical version of Don Quixote is richly unfaithful because it is, like all reading, by necessity an anachronism, inevitably, as with translation, the materiality of the original language is lost. What was normal in Cervantes is Spanish, is exotic in the Maynard version, and so on and so forth. Now, this uh, very devilish commentary on commentary, that's what George Steiner called it, is really at the center of, of Bella, of Professor Brodsky's topic. That is, it is a fiction that pretends to be a biography, while implicitly it is autobiographical. And it is not only implicitly about translation, but also implies and reveals that it itself is a translation. And so again, my question here, is there a significant difference? Now, this is what Bella's uh, essay brought to me uh, uh, to think about, uh, between autobiography and biography vis-a-vis -vis translation. <laughs> I ask uh, about biography versus autobiography because my own work uh, uh, on a biography um, uh, Puig uh, uh, dealt with, again, the, the inevitably non-objective narrator and to the concept that all narratives, fictional or not, are fictions. So as both translator and biographer, I have dealt with the challenges of subjectivity, memory, and interpretation, very much haunted by the pact of fidelity that such non-fiction writing involves. Autobiography, biography, and creative memoir are all in the end, evaluated by the strength, intensity, and inventiveness of their narrative structure, of the story they construct, just as translation is evaluated by its fluency, its persuasive rhetorical effect. Truth or faithfulness is less of a consideration than, than the appropriateness of form and the success of style. Subject matter in each genre is translated into content, and content is mediated subject matter. Autobiography differs from biography, apparently, because if the subject and writer-producer is the same, then we assume the common identity assures a much higher, deeper level of fidelity to the subject. However, considering that, quote, the self is constituted by a discourse that it never completely masters, close quote, how truly different are these two genres? The big difference, apparently, would be then that the biographer is situated outside of the life he or she wishes to represent and wants to work his or her way into, while self-writing, autobiography, gives one, of the, one uh, the impression of being too much inside and wanting to get out far enough to be able to have so-called more objective view of what's happening and what exactly one wants to represent. In an essay on the conditions and limits of autobiography, uh, one scholar, uh, George Gustav, examines Paul Valéry's radical proposal that biography, in order to be true, must go beyond its traditional limits. And I cite his thoughts on this topic here because, among other things, they also relate to Bella's uh, stimulating discussion of autobiography and translation. And 
uh, reveal as well an important source of Pierre Maynard and other fictions and essays of Borges, which features anti-realist theories of narrative art, as well as a poetics of writing as translation. According to the theory of, proposed by, of biography proposed by Valerie, whose Monsieur Test was a direct model and inspiration of Borges' famous Pierre Maynard as a kind of absurdly avant-garde super-intellectual, a biographer going between the actual life and his life writing would have to attempt to know as little of the following moment as the subject himself would know about the corresponding instant of his career. This would be to restore chance in each instant rather than putting together a series that admits of a, of a neat summary and a causality that can be described in a formula. Of course, this would be the impossible task. Causality, as we know, was one of the core issues of Borges' narrative art. And Valerie's point here is that the so-called real truth is nothing, unformed, blurred, and that therefore the original sin of biography, the same as that of autobiography could be, is to presume the virtues of logical coherence and rationalization. That is, we can extend Valerie's discussion of the prerogative biography to that of autobiography in that the task at hand is not to show us the objective stages of a career, but to the real, reveal the efforts of historian, translator, biographer, autobiographer to discover or reveal the effort of a creator to give meaning, the meaning of his or her own mythical tale. This latter statement basically describes Freud's attempt at autobiography and his study. On the surface, in this piece, he objectively appears to summarize his career, giving us much valuable information, but in reality, he's creating his own myth as an artistic or intuitive scientist a myth in which his early work as translator plays a major role. And I quote Bella's Freud, La psychanalyse, c'est moi. His autobiographical study curiously says less about the man beneath the persona than his essay, Screen Memories, or fundamental books such as The, the Interpretation of Dreams. In a way, this study, this autobiographical study, is a prime example of an omniscient narrator blind to his own subjectivity. From it, we learn useful facts, such as early influences on Freud, including reading the Bible and experiences, notably being in a very oppositional minority as a Jew. What he read or experienced or what influenced him is more about his real feelings or interests. What he actually says about himself in his autobiographical study is really about his ego and necessity for cultural power. For him, translation was a power play as Bella writes, quote, though he had a position as a lecturer in pathology in Vienna, it was his work as a translator that gained him entry into Charcot's circle of personal acquaintances and full participation in the activities at Salpetria Clinic, close quote. Freud's early work as a translator helped create his career as a scientist, and hence the persona whose theoretical work was practically based on autobiographical as well as clinical reflection. That is, Freud translated to be translated, <laughs> an experience again common to many translators. <laughs> uh, gaining entrance, as I or Gregory Rabassa or Edie Grossman or Lydia Davis, for example, did to the literatures and the cultures that they were drawn to, and to a certain extent entering that world and taking on another identity, uh, perhaps more glamorous perhaps less marginal than their own. Like Freud, I too felt like an outsider or a subaltern who had gained entrance. Um, but anyway, uh, um, uh, as, as, as Alison Bechtel said, what's lost in translation is the complexity of loss itself. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>